more may be coming down but whenever we get uh, started. We are now on the next to the last Sunday of our 1996 <coughs> series of adult education programs with Christians in the world around us. Next Sunday, uh, the 8th, uh, Professor Salvin Lee uh, of Princeton Theological Seminary will be with us to start a new series on Christians in other lands. Uh, and he will be discussing the Christian church in Korea, which of course has been the fastest growing church uh, anywhere uh, in this the couple of generations since World War II. And the series will then be interrupted for the rest of the Advent program, but uh, resume uh, after the new year with uh, programs on the Christian church in India, Christian church in China, and so on. Uh, last Sunday, we uh, distributed a request for help. And if any of you did not get it, <coughs> take it now. It's your opportunity to tell us what kind of programs we should be developing for 1997. Uh, Gordon Robbins has, has copies of this, and uh, we would be most helped by it. Today we come to the culmination of what by a general name has been a remarkable series, uh, and which leads us into uh, uh, the questions of relationships between the newest types of scientific knowledge and uh, the oldest questions in ethics. Uh, and we are delighted uh, to have with us again uh, Professor Roger <coughs> Shin, who is a Reynold Deaver Professor of Ethics Emeritus at Union Theological Seminary, uh, to bring this uh, whole series to a grand culmination. Professor Shin. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, since this is our last morning, I cannot uh, say to any questions, uh, I'll handle that next time. Uh, you've, uh, you've got, you got my pinned uh, today. Last week, we talked particularly about uh, ethical decisions, and uh, they're still on the uh, chart here just to uh, refresh your mind if you were here. Uh, decisions connect with diagnosis, with genetically engineered drugs, with privacy, with criminal law, patents, economics, with therapy, and then the most critical kind of therapy, uh, germline therapy. Uh, today, our last session, we turn to the issue of uh, self-understanding. And uh, there's just uh, three headings there. I hope to keep this uh, a little shorter than I've uh, been, so there'll be uh, time for uh, plenty of time for questions. I want to start with uh, a uh, preliminary uh, caution. That is, uh, don't rush to conclusions every time you read something in the uh, newspaper. I'll give you an example uh, here. Uh, this is just uh, two weeks old in the New York Times. Uh, Cystic fibrosis surprise. Genetic screening falters. Now, cystic fibrosis is uh, a very bad disease. It leads to uh, congestion of the lungs and uh, the pancreas, and uh, a very few uh, who have it uh, survive past the uh, age of 20. And uh, it, it might interest us because in this group, it's likely to be the most common of the uh, deadly uh, genetic uh, diseases. I mentioned earlier that the uh, Pesach is most frequent among uh, Ashkenazi uh, Jews. Sickle cell anemia among uh, blacks and uh, Mediterranean people. Cystic fibrosis among uh, North Europeans and their descendants. Uh, there's, uh, we, we've all got our uh, assets and our uh, vulnerabilities that way. The, uh, this particular dispatch starts out by saying that four years ago, uh, there was a kind of uh, ecstasy among scientists. They thought they'd located the gene for cystic fibrosis. And then goes on. Now the story is taking an unexpected twist. Human genetics, at least in this case, turns out to be 
far more complicated than expected. It's not just one gene of the disease, it's a, a combination, of various mutations. Uh, the, uh, we're still learning about, you see, and uh, may develop uh, treatments, uh, preventatives, uh, so on, but it's a uh, very complicated thing. And uh, one man who's been working on it goes so far as to say that uh, Mendel was wrong in concentrating our attention on uh, one gene, one uh, quality. You know, the uh, yellow and the green uh, peas. Uh, he says uh, there is, in fact, no such thing as a single gene genetic disorder. I don't think most geneticists would agree with that, that there's no such thing. But uh, a lot of such things that turn out to be uh, more complicated. And uh, the, the first uh, announcement is likely to be the most spectacular, and then uh, they head back. Now I'll come to a more complicated one that uh, will lead into uh, two and uh, three. Here is a uh, dispatch from uh, Newsweek magazine of uh, July 29th. The happiness meter. Hope that yours, as your happiness meter, is set on high because studies suggest that you're either born happy or, sorry, born to lose. <laughs> and uh, they thought they found a, uh, a uh, genetic cause for happiness that uh, meant uh, you were uh, booked to be uh, happy or unhappy, no matter who you married, no matter uh, what uh, job you won or lost, uh, anything like that. Now that was July 29, October 14, the heading, born happy, question mark. Geneticists have been claiming that DNA explains human treats as complex as schizophrenia, alcoholism, even happiness. Now the backlash has set in. They're finding out it was not that simple. And uh, uh, one sentence near the end, genes are propensities and probabilities, not destiny. Then on the same subject, uh, still more recently, this is just uh, uh, Friday after Thanksgiving, uh, front page article in the Times, uh, grumpy, fearful neurotics appear to be short on a gene, but then it comes down, uh, the impact of this particular gene accounts for about 4% of the difference in people's tendency toward neuroticism. You see, a lot depends on how you handle your uh, genetic uh, heritage. So that's the word of uh, caution. The uh, press, uh, uh, not all the tabloids, but the, the responsible press has done pretty good reporting on this. But you got to read the article to the end, not just the uh, headlines. And always remember the first announcement's likely to be uh, a little extra dramatic. Now that leads right into the next issue of freedom. Uh, what's it mean to have uh, free will, uh, to be uh, a human being who makes decisions in terms of chosen goals and uh, plans uh, toward uh, meeting those? Now here is an interesting paradox. The new knowledge in some ways seems to heighten our powers. We're more free than before. We can free ourselves from uh, uh, certain threats, uh, certain uh, ailments. At the same time, it seems to reduce our freedom. Say, what we thought were free decisions were uh, these unknowing uh, genes uh, determining the uh, chemistry of our uh, body. Now here we get into the old controversy between uh, nature and nurture. Biologists, in general, tend to emphasize nature. Well, that's their business. That's what they're uh, looking for. Uh, social scientists, educators, tend to emphasize uh, nurture. I mean, I as a teacher would like to think that my teaching uh, could make a difference in the lives of people, regardless of their uh, biology. And so the controversy goes on, and uh, nobody says it's 100% one or the other. Uh, it reminds me of a saying attributed to uh, Yogi Berra that uh, baseball is 90% uh, mental 
the other half is physical. <laughs> now, the, the biologists tend to say your makeup is 90% uh, genetic, the other half uh, culture, nurture, uh, social scientists, educators that tend to put it the other way. Now, the new genetic knowledge at first seemed to tip the scale toward biology. Not all the way, but as uh, they tip the uh, scale that way. But uh, the, the, the uh, prognosticators were uh, a little ambiguous here. Here's a, one uh, geneticist writes that uh, uh, we follow the orders of DNA. We have no choice. We are prisoners of our genes. I read that and I said, can he really believe that? And about 100 pages later in the same book, he says, not a scientist worth his or her salt would ever suggest that people, him or herself included, are just bags of genes. Mm -hmm. Organisms are more than just DNA and the proteins for which it codes. And then he ends up appealing for loving, creative lives. Well, why are you going to appeal for that if uh, it's all uh, settled, see? He, he uh, kept making up his mind, and though he's a good scientist, uh, he's not a very good philosopher. Uh, he doesn't put things together, uh, you see. Now, uh, at the same time that we're learning more and more about the genetic determination of life, and there is such, some such, we're learning uh, more about what nurture uh, does. Now, w we don't want to deny the uh, genetic. Uh, it's inconceivable that uh, I could ever romp around the trees the way squirrels do. See, I don't have the genetic equipment uh, for that. Uh, I've got some that I value more than that, but uh, that I, I don't have. Uh, there, there, there are the limitations there. But uh, a, a study by uh, a Carnegie task force on uh, what happens to people of infancy has brought out some uh, very interesting uh, material here. Uh, your brain has billions of neurons, those are nerve cells, in it. They make connections with each other in a great variety of ways. And one neuron can connect not just with another, but with uh, many others. And uh, according to the uh, Carnegie study, in the months after birth, the synapses, that's the connections between uh, neurons, increase from 56 trillion to 1,000 trillion. Now, uh, nobody knows how to count to 1,000 trillion. Nobody ever counted the synapses. Uh, you know how they do these things. But it's commonly said among scientists that the number of synapses in the human brain is about the same as the number of stars in the physical universe. Nobody ever counted them either, uh, but uh, you get the uh, idea. Now, a great deal of that development of the brain takes place in infancy depending upon your nutrition and upon the affection and stimuli of people associating with us. And so it's important that infants be well fed. Uh, parents uh, start reading to them very young, uh, uh, get toys that uh, require them to do something, you see, because the brain's uh, developing. Uh, here is a, uh, a uh, statement from the Carnegie Report. African-American babies are likely to die, of, are twice as likely to die within the first year of life as white babies. Now, uh, the issue is not just death, you see. The issue is nurture in all kinds of ways. And uh, if it uh, turns out that uh, on uh, measurements and so-called intelligence uh, tests, uh, African-Americans uh, are uh, get lower scores than uh, white ones. Why, if half as many die, uh, twice as many die in the first year, think how many get damaged in their uh, intellectual uh, potential. And so while 
we're learning more and more about the, what the, the genes, the DNA, do to us. We're learning more and more about what the uh, loving, affectionate uh, family that gives security can do. And so uh, you, you can't say the balance has really swung. Uh, it's about where it always was, with uh, great increased knowledge on uh, both sides. Well, how does freedom fit into all this? I said I'm not free to romp in the trees like a squirrel. Uh, uh, how does freedom relate to these causal determinisms? And uh, I give you uh, two examples that uh, help to persuade me that uh, freedom is not just an illusion, that it's a, a reality. Uh, neither of these is a proof. I don't know any way you can prove uh, freedom, or I don't know any way you can uh, uh, disprove it. But uh, the first one is just a everyday life. Uh, we all know what the law of, of uh, laws of gravitation are, and we know that if uh, I stand here uh, just relaxed, my arms fall to my side. Uh, if I want to hold them up, uh, that's an effort. But if I raise my arm, I'm not defying the laws of gravity. They're all working, but they have been, their operation has been influenced by a decision that I make. Now, I could raise my hand for a lot of reasons. I want to get attention to the meeting. I want to pick a cherry. Uh, I uh, want to uh, scratch my head. Uh, you see, a reason, not a simple uh, chemical operation, determines that I want to raise my arm and uh, again, I don't defy the laws of gravity, but the laws of gravity would never predict that uh, at this moment I'm going to raise my arm for uh, whatever purpose. Because freedom is not absence of causality, it's the entrance of a different kind of causality, a purpose, an expectation, an effort to uh, reach a goal. Now, uh, that's uh, one example. The other example is a very fascinating one that comes out of genetic science. You see, every cell of your body, except the red corpuscles, which don't have nuclei, and uh, the germ cells, the sperm or ova, has this complement of uh, chromosomes, the uh, 46. Every cell has your whole genetic uh, endowment in it, but most of those genes don't operate in most cells. That is, the cells that form the structure of my eye, those cells, uh, that DNA is in my toes, but I don't grow uh, eyes on my toes. And I don't grow uh, toenails on my uh, eyes. That is, the functioning of the gene is not simple one-to-one -one cause and effect. It depends upon the whole set of relationships and the needs of the overall organism. And uh, this suggests that while certain bottom-up explanations are helpful for many reasons, uh, that DNA uh, uh, probably responsible pretty much for my height and uh, some other uh, qualities. Uh, on the other hand, some work from the bottom down. That is, the, from the whole organism down to the details. Uh, now, so, so scientists went to work on fruit flies, and they actually succeeded in growing eyes on different parts of the fruit fly's body. Well, I don't have uh, eyes on my elbows and knees and uh, uh, feet and uh, so on. Uh, and uh, I hope no scientist is going to try that kind of experiment on human beings. Uh, it, uh, I'm sure it would not be authorized by the uh, government agencies that uh, monitor uh, all this. But again, it shows you uh, the whole has a lot to do with the functioning of the parts. And uh, it's not just that. Uh, you got a causal determinism from DNA to your body. The body gives orders to the DNA, as well as the DNA giving orders 
to the body. And again, that's not a proof of freedom. It is a suggestion of the possibilities of freedom in that the whole self is more than just the sum of the parts. The parts work differently because of their relation to the whole self. Well, that's uh, what I want to say about freedom. Now I come to the uh, third and uh, last for today, uh, playing God. That phrase came up uh, earlier in uh, some of your questions. And uh, it's a very interesting one. Uh, I think I mentioned that the uh, government-sponsored report on this had a chapter on playing God. There's a phrase that's just so common in our culture that uh, even the separation of church and state uh, that uh, crept into a government uh, publication. Now, I said earlier, the Bible is not a book of science. But in the, the Bible, uh, starting with Genesis and running all the way through, are these two themes about human power. In the one, the human creature is given dominion over uh, the Garden of Eden. A human creature names the animals. The animals don't name each other and they don't name uh, us. Uh, we have that uh, dominion. On the other hand, there's a strong sense of limits. Uh, Adam and Eve transgressed the limits. Uh, the builders of the Tower of Babel were trying too much to be like God. Now, uh, the issue is going to be how we relate these two, the sense of dominion. We can, through genetics, uh, heal some diseases that we couldn't before. This is uh, an extension of dominion. Uh, uh, where does this come to a rash playing God, uh, uh, messing up of the uh, created uh, order? The uh, 100th Psalm has a verse in it, know that the Lord is God indeed it is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. Now last Sunday in this uh, church uh, we sang uh, the hymn that Isaac Watts uh, made uh, uh, out of the 100th uh, Psalm as he uh, put it into uh, verse form. He made it a little stronger. Know that the Lord is God indeed without our aid he did us make. The psalm doesn't quite say that. Now, I don't think I would want to tell a woman in the labor that uh, God was making her child without her aid. <laughs> I uh, think her aid is uh, pretty important there. Uh, Isaac Watts uh, stretched it uh, a bit. But uh, certainly, uh, we didn't aid in the uh, construction of the solar system or the uh, planet uh, Earth, the uh, millions of years of uh, life uh, including three, four millions of hominid life uh, before Homo sapiens uh, emerged. Uh, uh, with genetic knowledge, we can give some guidance to the process and maybe uh, give God a little aid uh, that our forebears uh, couldn't give to uh, God. Uh, is it wrong to do that? Well, surely the message of the scriptures all the way through is that healing is a good. Jesus is known as the great physician. Healing is a good, and if we can extend our ability to heal, that uh, could be a, an obedience to God, a responsible exercise of uh, dominion. Uh, when does it get uh, too much. Uh, well, uh, uh, I go back to uh, Pascal, whom I uh, quoted uh, three weeks ago here, two weeks ago, I guess, uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, quote him again. Uh, this, uh, I don't think I use this particular quotation. Uh, it's a famous one. Uh, uh, Pascal, you know, the 17th century uh, the arrival of Descartes, a uh, great uh, physicist and uh, Catholic, though somewhat heretical uh, theologian. Man is but a reed, the most feeble thing in nature, 
but he's a thinking reed. The entire universe need not arm itself to crush him. A vapor, a drop of water suffices to kill him. But if the universe were to crush him, man would still be more noble than that which killed him, because he knows that he dies. And the advantage the universe has over him, the universe knows nothing of this. All our dignity consists then in thought. But then even the thought is ambiguous. Uh, and so he uh, goes on, uh, all the dignity of man consists in thought. Thought is therefore by its nature a wonderful and incomparable thing. It must have strange defects to be contemptible, but it has such. How great it is in its nature, how vile it is in its defects. Well, uh, there's a, you see, setting up the issue. Uh, here, here's a new human power, uh, how great it can be in its accomplishments, how vile in its defects. Uh, I sort of end up here with uh, another of the Psalms, the uh, 139th, which I'll read in a, uh, not the latest translation, uh, a traditional one I like. The psalmist says to God, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, I mean, the, the wonder of this simply increases with uh, all our uh, learning. Uh, still, we're awfully uh, fragile uh, beings. Uh, Pascal said a drop of uh, water uh, could uh, kill us. Uh, now, uh, a misplaced uh, nucleotide, uh, all those tiny, tiny things uh, can uh, do us in. We are wonderful, we are vulnerable. Now I'm about ready to stop for questions, but I was handed a question uh, last time by a uh, woman whose son uh, tells me she could not be here today, but he's going to tell her uh, what I did with her uh, question. All right. Or here's the question. Yeah. Uh, this, this got a little sting in it for uh, half of us. The scenes of war, crimes, massacres, and destruction seen day after day on TV show that these acts are 95% of the time perpetrated by males. And the word is underlined. Since sheer physical power and aggressivity are no longer necessary for survival, could the male genes be altered to lessen the destructive and deleterious aspect of the male personality? Testosterone, of course, but how and how much without harming the positive side? All right, now what am I, a male, going to do with that one? <laughs> uh, first, uh, let me say, uh, a, a number of people have uh, had this idea. I mentioned Marlon Brando once before, and uh, he uh, comes in with a particular uh, relevance at uh, this time. Uh, Brandon uh, had a very sensitive conscience about uh, the American Indians and about uh, some other uh, human uh, disasters. And when one of his own family got involved in a murder, uh, he got worried about human destructiveness. And in his autobiography, he finds some solace in the confidence that genetic genes will someday overcome human self-destruction and the will to kill. Uh, Tyre Desjardins, a uh, famous uh, Jesuit uh, paleontologist of a generation just uh, past, predicted the control of heredity by the manipulation of genes and chromosomes and looked forward to eugenics as a controlled process in the proportion most beneficial to humanity as a whole. Now, uh, that, that's, uh, in, a, in a way, a repetition of the uh, same question, you see. Uh, three comments. 
First, uh, it may be they're exaggerating what's possible. It may be that that, uh, like the happiness gene, you know, is, uh, it's got to be sobered down uh, a whole lot. We, we just don't know what's possible. A second, this difference between male and female, what in that is nature and what in that is culture? And we do not know. That is, most of the human race in all cultures has lived in times when uh, physical uh, strength uh, was more important to keeping the world going than now. Uh, now it keeps the uh, National Football League going and some, some other things, but uh, uh, <coughs> you, you don't need it uh, very much. Many a job, we once said, that's a male's job, uh, women uh, do uh, quite uh, easily now. So I say we don't know. Uh, my tendency, uh, maybe this is male defensiveness, uh, <laughs> but uh, in response to the uh, question that points to uh, male aggression here, is to say I see some signs that when women get into the vocations that formerly were res reserved for men, uh, they're about as aggressive as uh, men. Uh, I'm uh, told that uh, women managers of uh, mutual funds uh, operate with the uh, same uh, kind of drive that uh, men do. Or I uh, think of uh, politics, it was uh, Maggie Thatcher that persuaded George Bush, uh, or apparently did, to uh, uh, stand up to uh, Iraq and the uh, Persian Gulf. Uh, uh, she was pretty tough. Uh, uh, among the uh, present uh, people most often mentioned for uh, Secretary of State, I think that Madeleine Albright is probably uh, almost uh, hard-nosed, uh, though I'd leave that to uh, somebody like Phil Talbot uh, <laughs> to uh, correct me uh, on. That is, a, I I'm not trying to say you're as bad as we. I'm trying to say that much of what we thought was physical, genetic, uh, turns out to be related to your cultural situation and the uh, demands as you see them of uh, certain uh, particular jobs. So uh, on that, and I just don't know. Uh, I'm sure there are biological differences uh, between uh, men and women, and uh, as the French parliamentarian says, uh, viva la différence, uh, but uh, I, I don't want all those differences uh, uh, sacralized, you see. I uh, want some of them overcome. So uh, there, there, I, I don't know. And then the toughest one of all, uh, suppose we have learn that we can do this, how likely are we to do it? There's a tired hopes that uh, we would all together plan to make a more uh, peaceable uh, human race. Well, uh, would uh, there's any example I give is likely to be a caricature, you know, and express our prejudices. But uh, for the moment, uh, forgive me that. Uh, uh, would Saddam Hussein uh, go in for a genetic uh, alteration that would uh, make his people more uh, passive? Uh, well, maybe in relation to him, but not in relation to other countries. Uh, uh, think of Afghanistan. Uh, well, think of most any place in the world. Uh, think of uh, our professional athletic culture. Uh, would it uh, go in for something to reduce uh, male testosterone? Uh, uh, well. Uh, one of you particularly mentioned this uh, last time. Uh, here are new powers. How will we use them? And that comes down to an ethical decision. You see, the science can tell you what can be done and extend the power to do things. Uh, that does not of itself tell us that it would be good to do that. And that's why. Uh, you know, I don't like uh, the accusation of playing God used to uh, stifle what could be great medical progress, but uh, it's, it's got uh, some cutting power, just the same. Uh, uh, will we use these new powers to make a world me a worse mess of the world uh, than we've been having? All right, uh, I've answered one question already. Now, uh, what are some others? What other uh, ways do you see that they're going to use to change, you know, genetics and maybe 
cure certain diseases other than fetal tissue and uh, bone marrow and other things that we've seen so far. What other types of uh, things can be used to help change, let's say, genetic problems with health? Yes, uh, well, uh, the only ways we know are pretty much what you mentioned with the big distinction that I mentioned last time. Uh, uh, some of this done through drugs. Some of this done through uh, uh, gene splicing, uh, trying to overrule a deleterious gene with a healthy one. And then the possibility, this is what uh, uh, Tired and uh, Marlon Brando uh, and others are thinking of, uh, alterating the germ tissue. And uh, you were here last time? So, uh, we, we talked about the, that then. It's a, a much more complex thing. And uh, it, may, it may never happen. But uh, some people uh, are eager for it, and some are scared to death of it. I, I don't know any others than those. I'm not going to say there aren't any others. You know, uh, I don't know what tomorrow's paper will say. No, well, it's just an observation. Um, the, the whole <coughs> concept now that we're using so frequently of inter vitro um, uh, pregnancy, yes. and mating two people who are supposedly good to mate, yes. in this world of overpopulation that's resulting in quadruplets, quintuplets, and even eight babies in, in one litter. Yeah. You know, and this is really going the, the wrong direction, isn't it? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's, a, uh, that's a very real question. Uh, I uh, got acquainted with the uh, English uh, scientist who did the first successful uh, in vitro fertilization implant. And uh, he was a, a very humane person, really concerned that there are families that want children, can't have them, and he was going to help them. Uh, he was aware of the population uh, problem also. I, I would rather solve it not by saying, uh, all right, uh, you can't have any, but uh, I uh, prefer not too many uh, quintuplets and uh, octuplets. Uh, uh, that's a good, a good observation. Uh, yeah. Any comment on parthenogenesis and cloning? Cloning, yes. In the early days of uh, this genetic revolution, there's a great deal of talk about cloning. Uh, now you don't hear that nearly so much. There's a cloning of microorganisms. That is, you uh, you you uh, multiply some of these uh, these uh, genetically engineered uh, drugs by uh, cloning the uh, cells reproduce each other. Uh, cloning human beings, as I say, uh, once talked about a lot. Uh, I just don't hear much about it anymore. Uh, but you see, uh, it would mean the possibility, well, genetic twins are natural clones. Uh, I mean, identi yes, identical twins are natural clones. Uh, it means the possibility of uh, a lot like that. And uh, I think uh, most people have a kind of revulsion against it. Uh, as they think it through, well, immediately th think of who would be cloned. Uh, the people with monumental egos who, uh, you know, uh, want a lot of uh, duplicates of themselves. Uh, now, uh, l let me give you one example that uh, touches on what you said about in vitro fertilization. Uh, uh, Herman Muller, a uh, great geneticist, a Nobel, uh, Nobel laureate, thought, I told you this before, thought that uh, gene splicing would forever be impossible just five years before it happened, which uh, warns you to be humble. But uh, he wanted to improve the human race by sperm banks. That is, uh, collect the sperm of ideal fathers, uh, use it to fertilize a lot of women so that that higher heredity would be passed on. And uh, 
uh, Plato had some similar ideas, though less uh, sophisticated. And Booth pointed out, uh, we do this with cattle. Well, why not with uh, human beings? To which one answer is because human beings are different from cattle. Uh, but uh, now, uh, in principle, there's nothing against oval banks either. But uh, that's a little more complicated. And uh, I think it's now uh, uh, possible, but uh, was not in uh, Muller's times. So it was going to be uh, sperm banks. And then he got the question, how do we pick the ideal fathers? Well, he used to make up lists. And uh, Darwin was always on his list. On his early lists, Lenin was always there. On his late lists, Lenin was off. <laughs> Uh, Muller himself uh, spent some years in Russia, he was a Russian sympathizer, and then uh, when he saw what they were doing to science, uh, got out and, uh, and uh, changed his mind. But again, it, it shows you the difficulty. And uh, you wouldn't have a lot of identical individuals. You'd have individuals who were genetically identical, again like identical twins, except most identical twins are reared in the same environment. Uh, in this case, uh, the environments would vary, and it vary over time, because you have a frozen sperm bank and uh, wait a generation or uh, two. And uh, so uh, then you come up with the fact that a personality is a very interesting and complex relation of a set of genetic qualities and life situations. Uh, think of Lin uh, Winston Churchill. My uh, guess is that if uh, Churchill had lived in more placid times, uh, he'd have gone down as a, a man with a uh, gift for florid uh, rhetoric and uh, uh, who drank too much and uh, belonged to the British aristocracy and didn't understand the changes going on in the world. He met a particular situation in which uh, his gifts matched a certain need, and he becomes a uh, monumental uh, character in history. Uh, I don't think the world would be better off now if we had a hundred uh, clones of uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, but. Uh, What'd you say? Somebody loses a limb, for example. You know, some animal or animal form they are succeeded in growing uh -huh. limbs. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, th there are a lot of conjectures. Uh, you know, the, the conjectures that uh, you could extract DNA from a uh, corpse of 100 years old and uh, Grow it well. The, well a picture of dinosaurs, uh, you know, movie uh, uh, played that uh, theme. Uh, uh, always be very dubious. And again, you know, the, the ego of some people, uh, cyrogenics. You've got an incurable disease. Uh, you've got a lot of money. You set up a foundation and leave your will that your body will be frozen and then they're preserved uh, for a hundred years when they get a cure for this disease and then they uh, bring you back. Well, uh, you know what happened when Rip Van Winkle came back and uh, uh, it, 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 it lets your imagination go in incredible directions. Uh, yeah. For 200 years, uh, new discoveries in the science have seemed to challenge uh, traditional concepts of the power of God. Yes. Uh, with the result that churches have struggled with this. Uh, and sometimes it's taken a long time. What was it, two weeks ago that the Pope decided that uh, there might be something in Darwinism after all? Mm -hmm. uh, do you see in these latest genetics uh, approaches to an understanding of human life. Any fresh challenge to the concept of the sovereignty of God, uh, or are the 
going to be able to absorb these challenges too without uh, needing to change uh, our, our concept mm -hmm. of God's power. Yeah. I think I think we've got to rethink this all the time. And uh, take the concept of omnipotence. If you take this in a uh, sheer literal way, uh, you, you've got some incredible problems on your hands. Uh, I was thinking of this yesterday, uh, uh, driving down to uh, New York, uh, since the Christmas season's approaching, uh, we put uh, Handel's Messiah on our uh, tape recorder. And that uh, hallelujah chorus, for the Lord God omnipotent uh, reigneth, and he shall reign forever and ever. Uh, well, there are senses in which God's not omnipotent. Uh, the, uh, I think the crucifixion is evidence that, uh, as I uh, interpret it, uh, not everybody does, uh, God himself shares in the suffering of the world. Uh, God cannot, uh, just by a fiat, uh, eliminate evil. Uh, if you can live through Darwinism and events like the Holocaust and somehow relate that to your uh, faith, uh, you, you can handle the uh, new genetics. And I don't say it's uh, easy in uh, any case. Uh, I'm uh, looking for a uh, citation here that I uh, can't find at the uh, moment. Uh, uh, th take my example of raising my arm, not violating the laws of gravity, but countering them. Now, I don't know any universal field theory, the thing Einstein was always looking for, that would comprehend why I raise my arm, and just how that motive relates to the laws of gravity, uh, uh, I'm just sure it does. And uh, one uh, cultural anthropologist has said, the world can be viewed from many perspectives. Viewed from any one perspective, it's incomplete. Try to view it from all, it's confusing. And in the midst of some confusion, I and some reverent agnosticism before the mysteries of uh, God, I try to find some certitudes to live by. And uh, occasionally remember Albert Schweitzer said, uh, uh, never uh, preach uh, Christianity as the uh, intellectual answer to all questions. No intellectual answer to all questions. Our time is up. Well, Professor Finney, thank you very much indeed for the intensely stimulating series of talks. Uh, this has uh, taken the most of us into new terrain and uh, has linked the ethics to the science in a way that's important for all of us. So we appreciate your coming these two days. You've helped us a lot. And thank you. Uh, <laughs> mm.